So without any further delay, I'm pleased to introduce Joe Weinman. Joe Weinman is the Senior Vice President for Cloud Services and Strategies at Talx, the interconnection and data connection company. Joe um, joined Talx with 30 years of experience, uh, executive experience in leadership positions at AT&T, Hewlett Packard, Bell Labs, and he worked in areas such as corporate strategy, business development, product management, operations, and R&D. Joe was named the top 10 compute, cloud computing leader by Tech Target and was awarded 16 US and international patents. And he has more patents pending in cloud computing. He tells me they come in a burst. He is the recipient of the AT&T Patent Achievement Award and multiple AT&T Distinguished Speaker Awards. He has a, a variety of articles and talks published in venues such as the New York Times, Business Week, Forbes, CNN Money, Business Communication Review, the ACM, IEEE, CIO Magazine, and so on and so on. Um, Joe has a Bachelor of Science from Cornell University in Computer Science and a Master of Science in Computer Science from University of Wisconsin at Madison. He also completed executive education at the International Institute for Management Development in Lausanne, Switzerland. Joe is the author of a newly released book uh, by Wiley and he's here to talk to us about his book, which I hope you will sign later for me, Joe. And uh, he's built his book on a very rigorous and uh, long research, and we are really happy to have him here to talk about this. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm shooting for a personal best. I've got 40 slides in 20 minutes, so hopefully you'll help me achieve that. It'll be a new personal record. I managed to do 60 slides in 60 minutes once, but I think this is even better. Um, hypothetically, if I had a presentation, would it yes. be this uh, PDF? Yeah, I know. That there, goes, there goes the record. Five seconds. But it's like the dropping the baton in the relay, right? All right. So, um, yes, yeah, so this actually has been a hobby of mine, uh, which some people collect stamps and some people write equations. So, uh, what can I do? I guess I missed out on the stamp collecting gene. But um, what I'm going to do is take you through some thoughts on cloud strategy, uh, because a lot of people focus on things like cost reduction and uh, business agility. And I'm interested partly in can the cloud be strategic. And then I will take you through a little bit of uh, axiomatic foundation for the cloud and some of the math behind it that uh, inevitably turns out to impact um, the way that the cloud ecosystem will evolve. So, uh, most of you are students here. I assume there's kind of a background that includes computer science, uh, business, and also math. Um, so hopefully you'll find this interesting. So first of all, a little bit about Telex. We're the data center and interconnection company. So um, probably any email or text message or whatever that you send goes through our facilities. We're kind of like the airport where different carriers come in, only instead of United, it's Verizon and other carriers go out. Instead of Delta, um, it's AT&T, let's say, so we handle mobile traffic, um, lots of uh, high bandwidth interconnections. So I won't say much more about the company, but that's the background. Uh, this is the book, Cloudonomics, as Katia mentioned. It just came out in hardcover a couple of, uh, I guess it's a month now ago. Um, so starting to get some play. And so um, because I know you're all paying back uh, student loans, uh, I'll save you the requirement to buy the book by just going through everything right now for free. How's that? So a uh, few thoughts about the cloud as far as basic insights into cloud economics. Uh, first of all, there's a notion that the cloud is a revolutionary new technology and business model. Um, the primary benefit that it offers is cost reduction. A second one is business agility. Um, all of the huge super ultra mega data centers that you hear being built uh, with hundreds of thousands of servers that take up entire counties, if not planets, um, are the approach and the point behind that is to uh, develop lowest possible cost structure by leveraging economies of scale. 
Of course, rational decision makers like CIOs and IT managers will select the lowest cost option, which means that um, as more and more of those uh, customers select the lowest cost option, that will lead to concentration in the industry, so there will only be a handful of players. Um, another big benefit that people talk about in cloud financials is rather than expending capital, spending millions or tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollars for infrastructure, uh, there's the ability to shift that to an operating expense stream, which is, of course, much better. And that will lead to, as Nick Carr calls it, a big switch where computing will move out of the enterprise data center and into the cloud. And by the way, that will also lead to commoditization. You know, the, you'll have these huge information factories and all services will be identical. Um, and of course, the fact that cloud reduces computing costs in turn means that that will reduce IT spend. Uh, the only thing, I'm sorry, I forgot to put a title on this. Um, oh yeah, here's the title. Uh, this is what everyone believes, I think it's all wrong. And I think I'm going to hopefully in the next few slides explain why it's all wrong or if not wrong, then at least very questionable or debatable. Um, so let's start with um, commoditization of IT. There's, since you're, most of you are college students, what I call the pizza problem. And the pizza problem, if you are a service provider, basically is this. When was the last time you went to a restaurant and said, great pizza, who's your electric utility provider? You don't do that, right? You don't do it because it's hidden, irrelevant plumbing. And this is the challenge that telecommunications companies and over time, allegedly, cloud providers will have, which is how can you charge a premium for your services if there's a high degree of price competition among a commoditized product, right? So fundamentally, you could say that this question is, does IT even matter? And since many of you are studying computer science, it would be nice to know that it does. And in fact, it's a logical question to ask, and there's a best-selling book called Does IT Matter? A famous Harvard Business Review article by the same author called IT Doesn't Matter that preceded this. He toned it down a little bit for the book. And it's a valid question, and Nick Carr's argument fundamentally is, um, because IT has become ubiquitous, ubiquity leads to commodity, and anything that's a commodity can't possibly lead to strategic advantage, right? No, you know, Apple doesn't say, wow, we've been really, you know, able to deliver the iPad because there's air around our facilities and we can breathe it, right? Everyone can breathe air, so it doesn't possibly differentiate you. So it's a plausible argument, and it's one that we all really need to pay attention to. Now, moreover, there's some interesting data. This comes from McKinsey and Gartner, where if you look at the scatter plot, and if we just eliminate this, it basically says that by industry, there's essentially very little correlation between IT spend and profitability. And you can pick your metric, labor productivity, um, you know, uh, there's dozens of them, and basically you end up with data that sort of looks like this, that says, yeah, you can spend more or less on IT, and it's really not gonna impact your profitability. At least this is some cross-industry data. Um, now, um, there is some other data that seems to show the reverse. For example, this comes from Eric Brynjolfsson at MIT and his colleagues um, that basically says that the use of big data can actually contribute if you're one standard deviation away from the norm in terms of um, use of quote unquote big data, business intelligence, analytics, that results in a five to six percent improvement in profitability. And they look at different metrics and there's different results. Uh, some of it depends on, you know, whether you're allowing for a time delay between investment and return, but ultimately you end up with some positive data around that. Let me come back to this slide. This is some um, information from Sunil Mithas at the University of Maryland, and the important number there is that 1.912, um, and what it says is that basically there's a two to one payoff for uh, an investment in IT. If you spend a dollar on IT, whether it's depreciation expense for capital or whether it's an outright operating expense, you end up expecting to get almost $2 back in terms of the earnings on the marginal revenue that you would make or what have you. 
And fundamentally, I think there's the big strategic question, which is, um, does anyone know what this is, a photo of? This is Google in 1993. It's the uh, server rack in Larry and Sergey's dorm room that was Google. And the point is, Google right now has an over $200 billion market cap, $40 billion in revenues, extremely high margins. But if you think about how they were successful, uh, they are what I would consider to be the uh, data point or counterexample that falsifies the hypothesis that IT doesn't matter. Because if IT doesn't matter, how do you explain Google's success? It was just random. They had no access to uh, capital on a preferential basis, that they had like a lower cost of capital. They had no brand, right? They didn't have a company name when this was the server rack. Um, they had no preferential access to resources because all they were doing is indexing the publicly available web. And by the way, they were late to market. There were 18 other providers around probably before many of you were born, that were already in the market and had the uh, market presence. The only thing they had was a better algorithm, which obviously is expressed as IT, coupled with better ability to execute at scale in terms of the cost structure through things like not only economies of scale, but power engineering and being able to distribute queries to end up with um, the very low response times that they have now. So I would claim that this picture alone is proof that IT certainly does matter. Now, once we say that IT matters, what about the cloud portion of IT, um, which you, know, you could argue is basically most of IT today, or you could narrow down your focus. And I don't have time to get into these, but these are a number of the general use cases for the cloud. In the book, I go into some of the math, but basically, to give you a simple example of that math, um, a point-to-point -point communications network with n players has n squared connections, and so, you know, if you assume, you know, there's some differences in distance, but if you assume a connection costs a given amount of money, um, that gets very expensive as you scale, whereas a hub network only has order n connections, and so there's a crossover point at some point. And ultimately, I would point out that a hub or mesh network fundamentally is a cloud service as opposed to point-to-point -point networks that weren't. So if you want to date the electronic or electrical cloud to a particular year, uh, the correct year is 1872, which is when the first uh, telecommunications exchange uh, was deployed in New Haven, Connecticut. And that was a cloud service because before then, uh, what you would do is you would have a uh, you'd lift up your phone and there would be a wire going to whatever the destination was and it was a hardwired point-to-point -point connection. So if there were four people or places that you called, you had four phones on your desk. One meant call the hospital, one meant call cousin Ned, the other meant call the office, etc. There are also some cases where using the cloud doesn't really make sense. For example, if you're trying to compress data for transport, you wouldn't take all that data, put it in the cloud, and then compress it any more than if you were trying to transport frozen orange juice. You wouldn't take all the oranges, you know, drive them up in a truck from Florida to New Jersey, and then you know, uh, concentrate them here. So there's lots of use cases where, of course, you want to do it locally and on-premises. Again, no time due to the uh, attempted world record to cover this in depth now. So um, if you want to talk cloud strategy, I think that there are a few um, interesting models or strategic frameworks that say, forgetting about the cloud or IT, this is how companies can achieve competitive advantage. Um, I do have to say I didn't really like this model in this book originally when I first learned about it, which was a long time ago. And I have really come to appreciate thinking about it more its true beauty and excellence. So this is uh, Michael Tracy and Fred Wiersema, um, and it's the value disciplines model. And in a nutshell, what it says is there are three main ways to achieve some sort of competitive advantage or strategic differentiation. One is through operational excellence, which we could consider better processes. Another is product leadership, which is better products or services. Um, a third is customer intimacy, uh, which means better customer relationships. And although this isn't part of their framework, I think these days a fourth mechanism for strategic advantage is accelerated innovation. And that can be through 
better internal collaboration or through open innovation through partnerships and contests and so forth, and I'll cover these in more depth in a second. So how does the cloud contribute to all those? If we think about operational excellence, I think a good example is something like a uh, delivery logistics field support type of company where what they're doing is, like take UPS or FedEx, they have, I don't know what it is, millions or quadrillions or God knows how many packages they deliver on a given day. And what they need to do is optimally pack trucks. And moreover, they need to, based on the contents of those trucks, determine routes. And moreover, ideally, they'd like to do that in real time. So what they do is they can optimize those deliveries based on things like taking all of the data points around where traffic congestion is, feed that into routing systems, and then determining a, an answer to the computational complex problem of, it's basically the traveling salesman problem, but modified for real-time congestion, right? So computationally intensive, but it requires lots of sensors and endpoints based on where the treks are, data on the packages, feeding all that in real time back to a central type of algorithm. The net result is that they can reduce truck miles, reduce idling times, reduce fuel costs, reduce the number of packages that need refunds because they weren't delivered by 10.30 a.m. or whatever the time frame is, et cetera.